Hello everyone, today we talk about the role of the secular nobility in the Ottonian Empire. Uh, so it's essentially a bit about post-Carolingian Europe, taking that chiefly as, as an example, and especially the, the rise, the, en the endowment with the enormous power by the uh, imperial dynasty of the of the Canossa dynasty. And this is an important counter uh, video, let's say, to the narrative that I've used uh, often, which is still valid, of course, because as we'll see, it happened in parallel and, in fact, in contrast, or better, in concurrence, rather, to the um, famous Ottonian policy, especially, in fact, in the Italic Kingdom of the bishops' counts, so-called bishops' counts. Um, and this, f this is framed, in general, in the, in fact, in more general um, competition existing between the nobility, right, the aristocracy, if you prefer, broadly meant both lay and ecclesiastical, and royal power in post Carolingian Europe. Because the idea is mostly uh, kind of a dark one, right? What happened this time, uh, it's about the decline, at least to a certain extent, in fact, to to up to a certain point, depending actually on which post Carolingian kingdom we're talking about, because that's an important difference. Um, of royal power, right, and also the imperial one, as a matter of fact, and therefore this is interpreted rightly, correctly, um, through the rise of the nobility as de facto uh, autocrats uh, in in the in the empire, which is, is still existed, of course, and kept standing. This is, in fact, the aspect that we have to, in fact, start from because. If, I don't know, this thing had happened today with the mentality this time, basically there would have been lots of different powers emerging and all claiming some kind of strange, weird, um, secularistic um, and uh, extremely localistic prerogative that wouldn't like to have anything to do with, with anybody else, or at least in, in that kind of identitary sense. At the time, and, and so there wouldn't be any um, overlord, right, as there is not factually today, and as we have left behind centuries ago at this point, whereas at the time, um, ideas were quite different, and they still aimed, just by default, at the uh, achievement or attainment of some power that was s considered as sacred in a way or another. We'll not digress of how this went down, right, the imperium from literally the highest, uh, the highest ruler, to to the lowest knight, right? Uh, conceptually, in a religious military sense, um, we'll also, in fact, not talk about what the church really thought about this, because that was framed in a sort of different um, ideal that recognized the imperium, but also, you know, controlled it from from a standpoint that was somewhat, uh, in fact, the major reason why the, the secular aristocracy was, was adverse, eventually triggering the investiture controversy at the highest universal power level. But, more practically, the point was the following, that is, as long as an uh, overruling authority could legitimize the, basically any other, Right, and that had to exist, right? Because they believed in that hierarchy, they believed in that truth, they believed in that sacred, and in in, in those values. Uh, they could be legit, in fact, legitimized in turn. They could essentially share the imperium as a sort of, in fact, vassal condition, which had always been, since Roman times and even before, the idea. Not mu ha much had really changed, independently from the narratives that we have used, especially in the last couple of centuries or so, to describe this as a sort of uh, radically different scenario, but it factually wasn't, right? And it's obvious that the competition between secular powers and uh, whichever they were, right, including the ones that should have been imperial properly in nature, and the lesser ones, at least namely, because they, some vassals could be more powerful than kings, was never like aimed at the destruction 
one of the other, right? Preferably, of course, the the trend for everyone in this happening scale, depending on also the relation with the sub vassals, etc. This was true in any reality, also a clinic tribal one, right? Even the less stratified and more primitive realities was about essentially affirming your own rights um, and by essentially also denying in part the ones of the lesser uh, elements of the hierarchy exactly because the hierarchy justified that and so it was towards uh, the highest one that was criticized and somebody had the power to overthrow it was seen as the the right one right so it was a ferocious competition but that in such a fragmented reality like the post Carolingian one couldn't but happen also through an intense cooperation of various powers back in each other. So if you pick one of these kingdoms you say, you know, just the aristocracy was fighting against the the king, well, this is not true. Uh, there was essentially um, were essentially two parties as always, mostly, that eventually were all composed in different ways, they could argue, etc. But their action was either towards a more uh, a greater concentration of power, another in a, a greater disgregation of power. Based again on the individual perspective, the guy who fought the king uh, because he thought he was being oppressed by it uh, was actually oppressing those who were under him, who was trying to control him in, in the same way, right? And um, and we cannot. Uh, in order to explain convergences and concessions that happened at the time, because the feudal system that we know was effectively settled by the recognition, the royal public recognition of some prerogatives to some lords, um, to postulate, um, say, com in this case, um, a royal intent aimed at the damage of the seigneurial dynasties. Right, and nor the other way around. Some of these dynasties needed the king as an ally, exactly to be legitimized in their power. The king needed them because they could help him bring order in an area where there was a greater concurrent power. Right? Maybe the trend was, of course, countering the, mo the most powerful lords, at least in those areas that prevented royal consolidation by backing some lesser ones, right, and trying to balance the system. Usually the order had been like that. Think about the Roman Empire, right? The, the emperors were essentially for the people most of the time. It was the oligarchy that was not for the people. And so um, as powerful as it was, was struggling against the concentration of imperial power and trying to keep the mob down at the same time. And um, this is a narrative that you rarely hear because half of the West is fixated with, with the idea of tyranny and whatever that practically means, when historically, you know, the reality was often very, very different. But unfortunately, we have both that, I mean, a kind of a modernistic, almost kind of progressistic idea that the older order was somewhat rigged, while we don't understand that it was, first of all, in other context, but also when you understand that there is a universal pattern there that is valid also for our days, of course, it's about the people who have to handle it, right? And the outcome doesn't necessarily reflect a better or worse idea for about the, the form of what, what it should be. It's the substance that defected at some point as we are defecting today, right? Modernity is not wrong per se or, or right per se. It's just a consequence of it. what is modernity anyhow, by the way. Uh, it's just whether we are able to handle it or not. And this is not modernity's fault, this is our fault. So it was at the time for tradition, in a way. And again, tradition and modernity, after all, are much more blurred and blended and ultimately indistinguishable than we think is just an approximation. In any case, it's obvious that the king would seek alliances everywhere. And many times he sanctioned with his privileges so these were charters, right? They were uh, local situations of, um, are in fact, aristocratic altogether. Could be lay or secular, like preponderance that already existed de facto. So that's why the Ottonian example is quite useful. You know that the Ottonian dynasty was the Saxon, um, the, the the Saxon 
uh, ducal lineage that uh, took over the the um, re essentially resumed actually the, the imperial crown in Central Europe and reannexed under Otto the First the Italic Kingdom and not only so uh, to uh, to the um, to the um, to, to the direct control right the the kingdom had never fallen out of that on the contrary it was actually the most important because the Carolingians had attached the imperial title to it so it was necessary but by approximation what we call as Holy Roman Empire the Renovatio Imperio etc as you know happened with Otto the first 962 um, and this is we made lots of videos about the Ottonian dynasty so I will not repeat myself there is a playlist to think about the Ottonians so if you can check that out, it's always a very interesting passage. And the relation between, in fact, Germany and Italy is crucial because uh, of the aforementioned mechanism of the crown and of the centers of power. Now, when the Saxons took over Italy, they found a situation that was naturally very different from their own, especially because of the a degree of urbanization, at least as one of was one of the forms in which this this reality. Uh, uh, existed that were um, so cities and real cities that were um, ruled de facto by bishops right the um, the entire empire historically had been subdivided in districts that in part were in fact of Romano-Germanic they we were all uh, speaking of those countries of Romano-Germanic origin and that corresponds to, uh, either to the county, the, the the duchy, whatever. These were kind of like the older late Roman provinces that were kind of were smaller, right? The diocese had taken the form of the uh, of the older province by shape, by size, normally, etc. Let's not confuse too much the ideas here. Um, the point being that to any of these districts, normally corresponded by, I mean, historically a diocese. It means that for, since Roman times, these areas were, as you know, there was a, a secular government, uh, yeah, a public government, a statal government in, installed in the city, and plus the Christian church had developed there accordingly. This was the Roman Catholic model. In the British Isles, you have something else, especially in Ireland, and also you find that because of the original Celtic evangelization of England, uh, some kind of monastic bias in, in the fall. We have seen it recently with um, with Anselm of Holsta and of, um, you know, Lanfranc of Pavia, archbishops of Canterbury. But that's another thing. In fact, compared to post carolingian Europe, um, that uh, at the evaporation of public authority after the collapse of Carolingian Empire had unavoidably f fallen entirely, practically in the hands of the bishop. Why? Well, because the Franks in these countries, you see, speaking of the Italic Kingdom, we talk about essentially the Longobard one, and there traditionally uh, the central power was the city, like the dukes were urbanized, were installed there, they attended, uh, you know, the, the courts, they, they were literate, they, they exercised, etc. Um, they were kind of civilized. Um, the, the Franks were something else, right? The Franks were all only about war. And in order to be that, they had also a very particular, as you know, wealth, um, say, distribution for which most of the actual power laid in, in the land. Greatest tanks of lands naturally were outside of the city. And so the, Fra the Carolingian model had spread also in, in areas like Germany, like Italy, this kind of, kind of feudal system that had formed in fact also in these countries that originally didn't really have the same thing at least not in the same way it was in Gaul and also in different ways between each other um, a, a rural aristocracy that had developed further with the privatization in fact of the system after the, the end of the empire by in fact, yes, increasing mostly power in the in the land, in the country. This doesn't mean that the city was not involved in a war or another. But uh, let's say that for a while, especially in post these the centuries after the, the fall of the empire, the um, 
the true military aristocracy was kind of a rural thing. Uh, and there were comital prerogatives that were surely attached to the city, where in theory these lords would have exercised their public functions and so on, but in practice this, this thing had somewhat departed, or at least in some areas had never been the case, um, especially in France. I mean, in France even the, the kings inhabited outside the city, these huge mansions in the countryside. In Italy, of course, there had been greater involvement in the city policy, but it was the bishop that traditionally inhabited at that point since literally almost uh, a millennium in the city and having in that sense a role uh, politically uh, also militarily and, and socially that was very different from the one that th the Franks had imported from the north so um, this when the Ottonians arrived in Italy after a long time, in fact, of uh, imperial vacancy, more than else, also as somebody who had factually never ruled, right, the, the, the Carolingians had ruled literally from the Italic Kingdom. Lothair, as you know, had gotten the Italic Kingdom plus Lotharingia, and he was the senior and the most important, and the emperor and his descendant had ruled basically the most unitary rule uh, in, uh, in the post Carolingian world. And so, those Carolingians were already kind of Italianized in a sense. The Saxons were something else entirely. I mean, they were diametrically opposed. They were from Northern Europe. They were, you know, li literally all another, another culture, another stock. And so this contrast is interesting um, in many ways. But the, the Etonians quickly realized that they couldn't factually control the land if they didn't control the city. So given that they didn't have a particular interest in say first of all they didn't never had really a, a, a very sound possibility to engineer the country from scratch because their their control of Italy was always kind of temporary right they, they would have had to come back north of the Alps factually they didn't control even Germany by half the the the, the core land of of, Sac of the Ottonian power was Saxony and Franconia but if you speak of Bavaria or Thuringia it was another thing so great part of the Ottonian empires we've seen as empires were, and as early powers paradoxically were, were very extended territorially because they could exactly float over these local elites that for for reasons of cooperation and in fact cooptation also to power would agree of this external presence but without letting it to, you know, to root too much into the local affairs. Well, the Ottonians tried to do this in Italy. They had an important impact, especially on, on the papacy, because they began essentially to appoint. This was the only time in the empire that popes were factually appointed by the emperor. And this would trigger all a series of reactions, including the same Gregorian reforms, the, the century afterwards. That's another story. It still has to do with that, because still Rome had its own bishop, and it was basically the same thing, and there at least the emperor had to stay. Otto III, as you know, was a true Roman, right? Um, he, w he had both German and Byzantine blood, and he, um, he ruled from Rome, but also in his famous later letters to the Roman people, etc., you realize that keeping control of the city was quite of a problem. And so it was always a tormented relation in a way. Uh, but, in a sense, the Etonians could help, but in order to just pass through, because, you know, there were cities that they needed literally to cross uh, in order to reach Rome for the crowning, etc. This controlled choke points, passages, um, in fact, um, river crossings, mountain passes, and so on. So they needed to essentially negotiate with the local elite that was... The the Episcopal one, factually, in the city. And already in this, you understand how, yes, the Ottonians are very famous for this bishop-counts policy that is giving essentially comital prerogative to the bishops, in some cases, on the local district. Um, that is to say, factually, the, the land that revolved around the city in a way or another. What happened in the outer place, in the countryside, was kind of different because there were lots of other rural uh, dynasties that also claimed some comital power but in front of the emperor you know that literally conferred it to the bishop they, they couldn't really do anything and some had 
I don't know, extinguished biologically, other mixed with other. I mean, uh, it wasn't the relatively orderly pattern that could be after, I don't know, the Carolingian conquest were gradually, at least in this in this region, the Carolingians began to appoint their own counts locally, right? Sometimes it was done at all. It was not even a uniform, like every single district, every single city of the else had this count. They tried that, you know, think about the uh, the Missi Domici and etc. And the system loosely worked because, of course, the church provided with some advantages to the emperors and the kings pretty much everywhere, not just in Carolingian Europe. The church was essentially the more vulnerable to the secular aristocracies, was actually growing powerful in a military sense on, on her own, but in general the truly military hardcore um, part of society was embodied by the secular aristocracy. The church had some immunities that in the lack of public order, etc., would be easily usurped by the violence of the milites, and so it it stood mostly on the side of of the emperor of 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 the king. This was normal. Right? It wasn't just kind of a. It wasn't just this reason. It was also in general the advantages that would derive from in fact keeping down. Uh, also within, uh, you know, keeping down even say, structuring further the same ecclesiastical hierarchy. Think about Rome with Ravenna, right, or uh, other centers that, say, were creating problems to, to both. Uh, and this, especially inter international universal project, was, was more, uh, as we were saying before, it was rendered possible exactly because on a local basis it was much more difficult to invest, right, to create literally a state in some areas, I don't know, Germany or Italy, how, right? They, you lack the means of doing that. You would have met ferocious resistance in it. So the idea of accumulating power by bringing it from from the surroundings in general and gradually and um, exercising, intensifying the even the ideology of a, of a universal power, etc., what is what the empire here was and the church were re-engineering. Also, in the wake of the uh, renewed, uh, say, growth of of the continent that was taking place, so more resources and effective capacities. Right, the uh, the think about uh, how Otto the first managed to defeat finally the Hungers that wouldn't quite try again to set foot in the West um, uh, as a consequence, and the same lesser elites benefited from the expansion of these powers and so uh, they they would have been more framed under in fact the universal authority but still having in absolute terms more power than they had before the the greater the fortunes of the former were so sy systemically it, it's intuitive to see how this would work in general how civilization r expands uh, after recovering it is this critical moment in the previous in the previous century, um, and the the church is also not hereditary, right? The bishops can be they die at a certain point, and they do not leave their power to to a dynasty, to a lineage. At this point, bishops actually had families, children, uh, and so on. But they, in the administrative practice, they didn't. There was no formal, uh, no recognition, let's say, of inheritance, or something like that. The church elected its own representatives and the Ottonians in this sense kind of comforted um, the the elections that their, their own way and they had a very important power there because of course also the imperial military power was 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 mm. capable of putting enough pressure to elect some candidates rather than others and naturally at a local level there was always some somebody who was pro emperor or against emperor for whichever reasons they were also connected to the local competition um, and, and whatever, right? So the church had immunity, so in theory also their properties could not be touched, so no sp uh, split of that by inheritance nor confiscation or anything, so it was an important asset to invest in just in, in future time. This is what the Carolingians had attempted to do themselves before, you know, especially Charlemagne and Louis de Pius, they were 
kind of enlightened rulers before the, the empire would crumble again because it was just a private and in fact inevitable thing as how the Franks had created it and so they 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 worked a lot to recreate also in northern Europe this kind of ecclesiastical structure provided with some degree of public character that could escape in some way to the private system whereas you know it, it was still private because still the the clergy were, were part of the were somebody's brothers or children etc and so they they, they were actually very often um, grown uh, educated as initially not necessarily even knowing they would become clergy so they were kind of military men themselves maybe and they had a quite private mentality themselves and their families and their lineage and how to use violence and all the bishops had their own military power in the city they could mobilize the local communities they weren't really yeah the, you know they didn't have dramatically powerful armies on average right some in some areas again they were more militarized but they had an enormous power factually right these cities especially in southern europe had, were kind of still massive infrastructures from roman times they were inhabited they were rising as centers of power they had wealth they had skilled personnel they were people were literate there they, they knew how to make an administration work and this administration was in fact the episcopal one that's also from the, the, how universities were born in the cities just a century afterwards so they were quite active in dynamic areas that could also for example support the same logistic logistical for example the, the imperial expeditions paying money subcontracting the all the, the supplying systems and stuff by the by the emperor so for them it was an investment as well and it was generally speaking the bishop who controlled this the the rural arist aristocracy the, or the secular one that still controlled some cities in a way was in parallel was existing right next to the bishops uh, and generally speaking was more floating in a way was also more warlike so generally presented more of a problem but still could be used by the emperors in those situations that show how Episcopal power could be in itself maybe too too great and needed some counterbalancement in the in the process um, that's why here the Italic example is so important already from the time of Otto the first because there the royal power tried to uh, stem the sphere of expansion of the same temporal power of bishops right that had a lot of land a lot of power it, especially in the areas as we've seen the same popes we made a video about the origins let's say of um especially of papal power uh in uh, in these areas that especially the aforementioned ravenna as well that had been byzantine and under in the byzantine world originally this these areas had emancipated themselves but they they had they could do it in part also because all the fiscus land the dem the demand essentially was the churches like when the byzantines kind of you know didn't show up anymore because factually the local militias took over control at on behalf of the popes uh, the, uh, of the and, and the bishops all the land all the public land was the churches right and as we've seen there was a pretty uh, virtuous mechanism for which also the local secular aristocracy would like to be part of that because the popes were still part of the local n roman nobility and they uh, that then they had the the local militia as we've seen was a very prestigious military career as well and it had a, an international uh, scope given that Rome was still the center of the world and the local inhabitants knew perfectly well that they could exploit that. The nobility was extremely proud of itself and its own powers and capacity. They could, as we've made the, fir the example before of Otto III, make leverage <laughs> exactly as, you know, part of the imperial capital. Because always remember that imperial crowning had to happen by tradition since Charlemagne's time, not just by the by the papal crowning, but also the uh, the approval of the Roman people, right in the church, which doesn't mean like shoemakers, etc. We're talking about the local barons um, in arms that had to to agree that. So that was further 
negotiation contract. And so that, that, that is how complicated ruling these places were in the first place. And sometimes the church could, in this sense, become too powerful. The bishops could start expanding their own uh, influence on certain assets and prerogatives that were not really their own, or maybe that they 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 were their own because there was really no other way but to recognize them, but they had to be countered in some way, right? So aside from so the the bishop counts, that are kind of the most evident side of the story in the Italic Kingdom. There there are also some lay characters loyal to the emperor, of course, um, that were favored by the Ottonians, in fact, mm, mm, through the donation of courts and also, in fact, the concession of the comital jurisdiction. So, in other, in other words, they were recognized as the de facto rulers, both privately and publicly, of the land. The exercise of justice, again, especially in these areas, were mm, increasing, can come growing again, especially in terms of, of assets, trade, monetary economy were were extremely remunerative by having control in the tribunals on the disputes it literally meant to determine who controlled the land uh, how much had to be exacted from it so uh, enormous power and uh, famously enough by Otto the first was favored among the others by the way the Longobard family of the Canossa that we mostly remember because of Matilda and the uh, investiture controversy, etc. But it was a hell of a power in the Marquisate of Tuscany that, in fact, benefited enormously uh, in Emilia. That is just in this region, just across the Apennine in north of Tuscany. That, by the way, had an immense strategic significance for the Romfart, the uh, the imperial expeditions to Rome because uh, the Canossa controlled some of the most important river crossings in the Po Valley, some locks, some bridges that were necessary up to almost, the, in fact, the Adige Valley from, that descended from, from Germany for the crossing, from, from in fact, the, the imperial expedition from Germany to Rome, right, an imperial road. So that is an incredibly uh, cl and clamorously uh, macroscopic example of a lay power that was reinforced dramatically, would, would remain in fact traditionally kind of pro-imperial in spite of the fact that it would also in part side with the Pope for political reasons at some point and this enormous power would also famously remain in fact as an object of content at the extinction, at the biological extinction of the of the Canossa uh, because both the Emperor and the Pope would claim this enormous uh, stretch of land in central northern Italy as their own right, and great part of the fact of the investiture struggle, the fact was also fought over this land that eventually kind of lost it, its own in fact, secular compaction, because at that point the, the communes were rising, so that the, the area went fragmented, the power passed. You know, it was the 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 urbanized military class and the and the local citizenry that took over the bishop prerogatives, began to rule the city states, as we've seen uh, here and there, very often on our channel, and so it would change. But namely, right, you know, the authority that could legally claim control over this land uh, was yet to be determined right for many reasons that were not now we don't explain also the church had all since Carolingian times had always essentially demanded a recognition of the you know what had been promised by the Franks technically never never respected and it could never be attained by the church alone of essentially control of, all over Italy Right, so this had to do, especially as far as the Marquisate of Tuscany was concerned, because part of the uh, metropolitan district of Rome encompassed, in fact, um, encompassed part of Tuscany, southern Tuscany. It's another 
another issue that dated back to, to longer times, even before. That that that's um, a completely different thing. We we have been naming the Canos uh, randomly often, and I realized that we never really made a video about them. Maybe that's that's an idea for a new one at some point. So, as you understand, in all this process, the political game was very very intense among the king, the powerful families, the bishops. So that the ecclesiastical powers, so first of all the bishops, especially in this area of Europe, participated rather willingly also beyond the defense needs against the uh, dynasts and the um, so actively pursuing some, you know, autonomous, even aggressive st uh, strategies and policies, and of the needs to essentially compensate the shortcomings of public of the public system that were kind of the light motive of the 10th century, can be explained when we consider the internal force that privileged those powers and that solicited their dynamism. That is a capacity of organization that starting from the cultural structures that were restored since the first Carolingian age and also nourishing themselves or religious traditions that were rooted in the territorial areas that were visibly expressed, for example, in the cathedral churches and in, in major manus, uh, monasteries, invested also the economic sphere, rationally administrating, for example, the based and inalienable assets, as we've seen. And on, on this economic base um, was building spontaneously, uh, associating in, in various forms with the uh, subjected collectivities, areas of seigneurial autonomy. Mm -hmm. And consider in this that the, the church had just the secular counterpart model to, to imitate, because as we were saying before, also very often we're talking about the same families. Bishops were coming from noble families themselves, so they often were also in acting in concert with them. So, as you understand, was the exploitation essentially of a of a public power gap mm -hmm. that you know renovatio period not the imperial power was not present everywhere was uh, uh, coming and going right was still negotiating with the local power so factually we are seeing pretty autonomous realities that we're saying okay the the government you know the, the authority is not here so we will be the authority Right, and they factually were, right? You know, they were more often than not because still it was kind of a vassalatic order, and especially if the the emperor was not there, and he often was not there because expeditions to in this case to the Italian kingdom happened every once in a while, were not really continuous. Well, they had always been there as the, the, the main powers, um, and so they would just seize the opportunity in a moment again of important revival of European dynamism power and especially in a country like Italy advantaged by the essentially the the Roman tradition and we'll see better now the fact that the church f factually represented an alternative to imperial power probably because it was habituated historically through a, a massive administration in international um, prestige and uh, uh, spirit, you know, international connections and spiritual prestige mostly, uh, a, a massive net, right, of, of, of government and, and managing m massive resources, right? This had been even, especially, in fact, during the second invasions where the country were, was ravaged by, by the Magyars, by, by the Saracens, where the local powers, very often also the papacy had to, to roll up their sleeves on their own, and to kick out the invaders on their own, even succeeding, interestingly enough. Think about the Battle of Garigliano in 915. It was a massive coalition. Uh, they, uh, even the Byzantines participated. It factually was hegemonized by, by the papacy. And, and some also, of course, uh, royal 
um, help but um, showing even there if anything you know, can you can mobilize troops you can command them you can you know successfully uh, employ them St from a strategical point of view really you really have power you have a really a hell of a power and so this was possible again because of the this kind of still leaving veins of that older public system that of Roman origin in some way that had maintained itself and that was controlled now by these local lords, lay or ecclesiastical um, alike. And that especially in the ecclesiastical case also received the support of the local populace just by default because the again the bishop was the point of reference of the cities, for example. He had a de facto a, a unitary control, right? It was a, you know, it would just we think, but you know, the lay and ecclesiastical progress were separate. Doesn't matter, right? The, the bishop was de facto a huge private lord in the city, and plus, yeah, he had all the advantages of being at the center of this public international net of the church that still conferred even further capacities, skills, personnel. Uh, connections and so on so it's obvious that the entire community would gravitate around which other power existed right if uh, properly or uh, not, not even a king was there very often right you know that the Salic kingdom was kind of fragmented between marquisades duchies etc and even foreign counties intervening but not quite a king there were multiple kings or even multiple emperors at the time so because it was easier to reach Rome just geographically the distance. Um, so this power and the same church would take on a, a seigneurial phase, unavoidably, right? So this was a process that again was ha had started ever since the church existed easily, right? And you can trace it historically very well, and it's kind of overlooked. Um, and the example definitely uh, that uh, caused the 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 impulse to the military strengthening came from the traditionally armed aristocracy the lay one and it is also true that the ecclesiastical powers already provided with their own institutional autonomy and often uh, for a long time strong of official immunity right so that was recognized by this reactivating public power lay powers offered uh, in turn to the lay mo uh, to, to the lay lords the model of um, officially recognized and concurring seigneurial construction on the base of this peculiar landed Dominion, and with together with the royal public, mm, uh, say order, in a way. In other words, the lay aristocracy also looked at the church and at the cities. So the same thing, in a way. In order to um, to to develop its power further. Right. So at the same time as we've seen, the, the the imperial power was was working with the city, working with the bishops, also with the lay aristocracy. So it was a blend where unavoidably, also lots of aristocrats or well, lay aristocrats would urbanize. Right. That's also how the communes would have been born because factually it was those those knights from the countryside that beginning to live in the city where they had stepped gradually in and kind of been absorbed by because because they were the main centers of business of trade or the loot of their raids of their uh, border feuds etc would be reinvested in the local markets in uh, specialized uh, agriculture around the city and so on would factually come to a germanized power in the city it's itself and that was the consular regime that is the fur that uh, marks the first phase of communal history so this is particularly interesting, you see, because it's um, a meeting point, especially in this kingdom, of um, 
of a truly public model with the uh, with the private mil military mostly military one right a public civil model with a m private military one so in many ways again there you have the equation again of the Italian communes later on right and why there were city states unlike any other city in Europe for real and and why they were also military powerful why they waged war uh, across their own district with their own armies because again the entire community especially in, uh, in this area of Europe where the city was really controlling a bit everything at least there was no area of the countryside that didn't really gravitate around the city right in France or Germany you had literally areas that were didn't see the city right they lived out of it that it had always been like that it could be noble men could be villages people living literally in the woods here the thing was completely different right the country was at the center of major international trade routes the Mediterranean this massive also influence from 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 other wars the Byzantines the Arabs and and the Germanic world as well was ordered in a in a Carolingian fashion it had this higher degree of urbanization this higher degree of literacy this greater individual wealth um, the thing was expanding further so it's obvious that here the entire system would blend in right and develop further in ways that as you see would uh, eventually even you know surpass the ecclesiastical power itself because the church was important but never to the point that it managed eventually to to maintain say a truly enterprising military power on its own right um like an empire or something right and extending uh, swallowing chunks of other lands etc no they, they had important power. they had important armies etc but they were still a contained power whereas the cities eventually would take over on behalf of the same episcopal authority as communes developing that kind of aggressiveness instead and you know being at the base of just the other days we were talking even up to the time of the seniors or the regional states like right? starting from the city is becoming a real state and a major even power in in Europe so you understand from how you know how to see history in general right you, you can't start from from a point and ending up to another because it's all connected right never think of history like a series of scanned phases where you know first there is this then there is that no it, it's all one right and very often it, it's always the same thing really right never think that history is you know made up of eras of things that really changes they're always the same places they're always the same people right um, civilization develops in the process but things remain too uh, in some formidable form and the legacy of the same civilization doesn't die right there are not dark ages when things are forgotten nobody uh, the middle ages blows your mind uh, incredibly easily if you really studied it with a minimum of, of attention now there's been a historiographical debate among medievalists regarding the interpretation of the ecclesiastical developments in post Carolingian times um, and this is a non problem in many ways in my opinion because it, it really proceeded from the multi multilaterality let's say of the ecclesiastical influence that for one side was led by a theological culture of Mediterranean origin to postulate great government apparatuses right so again the Roman legacy there is not really uh, an opinion uh, these were traditionally incl inclined as you know responsible of the public good right of, of a public power and welfare and authority uh, and 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 this is why it, it couldn't be possible any other relation with uh, with this uh, uh, with the strong one that the church had with the regnum that the sacerdotium had with the regnum right you know that, that's why it, it, you know 
from, from Germany or from France, people had to come to Rome to be crowned, right? It's not that somebody said, oh, you know, let's um, simply decide uh, to, 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 let's say, remain, to, to have our authority connected to, to, to uh, a power that stands, uh, I don't know, 1,000 kilometers away, we have to cross in arms uh, with enormous risk and expense, etc., for, for no reason. There was no other alternative. Hell, the, the Roman Empire uh, had, you know, was not over even half of a millennium before. There was no other possible place but to rule Europe and the Mediterranean, but from a place like Italy, fundamentally. And this is what the Holy Roman Emperor, in fact, unavoidably and intelligently always tried to achieve. For this specific reason, th this started from Carolingian times, right? All the imitation of the Roman um, papal uh, administrative cultural structures, it was unavoidable. You couldn't, this is what they lacked. They had always lacked a public power, something that was big, like a state, something north of the Alps. And nobody had ever seen that. And, and that's why things like the Carolingian Empire collapsed, because they, they were entirely private enterprises, right? That once they overly expanded, they had no other thing to rest on together, but collapsing. So this in part created some other important legacy in Western identity, etc. So it's not just this aspect, right? But th there is definitely a strong legacy in that regard that is constantly overlooked because again, um, the especially southern European history is disgustingly overlooked in popular culture when it comes to the Middle Ages, right? We basically switch the, the interest, right? The first thing you think about medieval times, the, the Vikings, you should be thinking about things like the papacy rather, because those were the things that really mattered exponentially, macroscopically more than any other kind of, you know, it could be a... a temporary phenomenon of, of piracy and for, you know, an, an incipient subtle formation in the north of Europe. Uh, in, in southern Europe, the, the, the system was dramatically more advanced by a scale that, again, nobody cares because it, it's too complex to understand, right? Too much effort, too much, you know, and, and um, yeah, again, let, let not make me digress in general how people get interested in the Middle Ages because it's utterly disgusting in the first place, but just you, it's fair to assess that a good 95% of, um, uh, of, of public um, appreciation for medieval history is complete and utter garbage. Basically, it has not even a single minimal historical value whatsoever. It's just an idea of, you know, what, I don't know, it stems from, from movies, from video games, it has nothing to do with, with an historical culture. And this culture is the core, the hardcore, universal backbone of Western identity and moral superiority. And this is what, again, has been deprived from us, also because of the, the, the massive damage, the, the destruction, the iconoclasm that we have made of basically any, any trace of sacred, of universality that has been just, you know, insulted and derided, etc., by the the Ketonic Pelasgian masses that have taken over in, in their individual uh, inferiority to, to bring to <laughs> to the childish illusion that somebody's opinion uh, must forcibly have any value. Uh, these are not m matter or matters of personal opinion. Right? We have to recover what is the truth. And historically speaking, we cannot really do it otherwise but like this. Um, so, again, if, one is, if you're not prone to accept medieval history in these terms, stop studying it. Right? You know, because even if you go on, and you have been going on, and I know people have gone on for an, a lifetime, and still haven't gotten this elementary th these things you can assume from simple medieval history manuals right if you if you again do not achieve that do not attain that you know what what is the chance that are you going even to to get anywhere by scale in terms of even a remote medieval knowledge uh, it's impossible right it, it, it's beyond 
your 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 capacity at that point because if those are the limits that you propose yourself it's all right and that's what i often see in fact in the uh, even in just in the topics that people are the subjects that people are interested in in my videos um it's basically ethno-nationalism so essentially a leftistic revolutionary ideology of the 19th century that came on the fore exactly after European tradition was destroyed and people today exchange for tradition because again they have not even a, a, a glimpse of literacy in terms of what um, moral values fu fundamentally are just you see them how people live normally um, and what they get interested in and, and it, I must say it, it is painful because like you know what's my background right uh, professionally so you can imagine for somebody who studies all that time these things how frustrating it is that uh, there's no response right maybe I, I know if, if only one person has gotten this point I'm happy about it and it's it's and it's worth it but that I, I know that that person potentially may be enough but practically will not be enough right so sometimes maybe not even my work will be enough and but I will always be here to explain these things uh, if I can because I still hope that by overloading the internet with this stuff somebody at some point will understand more and there will be something more systematic and structural to start from really thinking what's the worth of humanity um, not abstractly but literally talking about you personally I mean you that you're listening because you may not have any idea of that as most people not even myself had an idea at some point uh, but we're really living in very dark times like in very dark times where every single thing that is said is fundamentally misunderstood um, manipulated uh, practically you know it's all a conspiracy theory about everything forever right so it, it's terrifying but I still think that there is hope for humanity because if you stop uh, thinking there is also you know what's the point uh, of going on in the first place so I accept the challenge because if, in fact I believe in tradition in as much especially in the in the doctrine of struggle and victory so um, I believe in in the transfigurative capacity of mankind if they, they manage to, to fight against any odd and so that's my greatest ambition and pride and identity as a as a European right and that should be for everybody in the world by the way but again at this point studying it from from this specific history is, it's it's the only option we have because not necessarily anywhere else in the world we have the same type of uh, material and method and background and mindset to study them from you cannot call a Chinese to explain these things. It's impossible. They they lack the cultural tools to do that. They've they've been completely deprived even further, and they've been engineered further to properly annihilate any form of understanding about these issues. I mean, in China, people are grown without properly being, uh, you know, aware of the existence of historically of of something like religion. So, imagine the nightmare. It's like you know, Satan's uh, like it's, it's hell on earth, right? And not surprising we're still talking about that at least formally a communist country that of course couldn't achieve what it the rel not the actually the even so impressive thing that it does if it wasn't actually something more uh, capitalistic uh, because communism is the denial of any possible human form but in, in any case that's still a way to control them and to properly deprive them of any interpretation of tool of reality. If without history, that's that's the only possibility, right? So, study history. I mean, seriously, not bullshit on the internet. Not even listening to my videos because this can help you as a guide. Because of course, I know that what I'm saying here is probably what you will never find on the internet ever. But, uh, and I'm aware of that. And I'm telling you, not because I think I say particularly good stuff compared to my standards but because I know that there is not out there I checked that right and there is no trace of anybody really showing any any you know, effort to do and talk about this and also to watch by the way 
And I'm sure this is the, even by the title, the boring one that you don't want to listen. Whereas if I make, again, uh, something about some people of the migration era, you get triple view, you give me triple views. And that that's frustrating, again, for this reason, because these are simply more complex things to understand. So if you're not interested, it's, chances are it's because you're not really capable of, in other words, you're not intelligent enough to understand them, right? And it's really about the willingness. It's not that you can't, because you always can. Everybody can. But that's the the problem of lack of intelligence. It's not to say stupidity that is properly denying your value as a human being to understand things that are more important. And so what do you live for? Again, that's what they want you to transform you in. I'm here to say, wake up, right? Because nobody's going to... Uh, really give you anything in this world so for free so somebody who spends at least a long time asking you just some ad just by the way because YouTube imposed their own so I, I tried to cash myself in exchange and I wasn't doing it as you know at the beginning and I didn't want to well you could you could exploit it's like a, it is a sort of gift a sort of at least it, it it only depends on what use you can make of that and at the same time, uh, to conclude on the, say, of the ecclesiastical uh, advantages and, and backboning here, is that there's not just a civile public tradition of Roman origin that makes the magic here, and had already made the magic in properly establishing Rome as the morally superior, uh, the spiritually superior, and uh, you know the, the un unchallenged center of the West, even before the Gregorian reforms during the early Middle Ages, because of its immense prestige and in international connections and cooperations, because these were not imposed by anybody. They were freely, um, you know, in, in enjoyed by the Franks, by the Anglo-Saxons. The achievements of the Church of Rome were immense in the history of civilization, and I'm surprised also, again, to, to see so much interest for for polities that um, uh, I'm not talking about the Vikings in that, in that instance. I was really thinking about something else, but I will not say that because it seems. Now I'm actually thinking about the Byzantines. I can't tell that, right? That's another thing. Every time I make Byzantine history, people click on it. That's a bias that developed in the tense of the uh, of the 21st century, stemming from. Let's let's talk about it. It's medieval total war to mods. Right, people discovered that the Byzantine Empire existed for some reason. They made it. I don't know for for which reason. The hardcore symbol of you know uh, tradition, resistance, whatever. But you know, do you have an, any idea of what actually, even in an anti kind of Latin Germanic sense, by a certain degree? And there are different. Uh, you know, everybody has their own idea regarding these things. But I see that. You know, nobody wants to see the papal content. Everybody was in. The, the Byzantine one. Why? Right. That's pretty bizarre to me. Uh, from from a you know from a doctoral standpoint in medieval history, as I teach, even uh, at this point, uh, to to properly, uh, it's a meme, right? It's a meme culture. Again, it has as I was saying before, it has nothing to do with history. It's properly actually a lack of historical knowledge to bring to these things. You should love. Uh, you know how many videos about Byzantine history I made, and I'm not there to talk uh, bad about that, but I'm also resizing in part the universal, um, say, accomplishments that eventually were attained compared, at least compared, to the West, because the Byzantines did something extraordinary in their history, enormous, magnificent, right, but still, again, why don't we look, you know, stop this kind of self-criticism and defeatism and um, Vietnam War syndrome or whatever um, about ourselves, right? We had the best stuff, the best values that we shared with the Byzantines, shared with others, right? In part, it was a universal culture we shared with the Muslims as well, uh, by some degree, of course. Uh, but no, the West is so vituperated, it's so it's self hatred, right? It's it's it, it stems from the individual failure. And therefore, the rejection of everything they came from, not realizing that the problem is, the, is themselves, 
not the system. Don't tear down the system. Our system is the best in the world. And history proves it empirically in an incontrovertible way. What the hell are you looking at? That's my perplexity. Um, so Rome surely had, and, and the churches, the, the bodies at this point, again, Rome was even not just the sole center, at least in, in, in relative terms. I, I mean, in, in absolute terms, other, I don't know, other bishop, archbishops had important ambitions, right? Well, these were fueled by also the relig local religious tradition. Right, this sense of uh, almost municipalism. Again, the the the, uh, the roots of the communes are there too. Right, the the enormous landed uh, expansion, for example, the enormous estates that the church owned, um, and 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 this is exactly where the uh, royal officials and the military initiatives of the lay aristocracies were challenging the episcopal power, city power, because they saw that, uh, look at this, you know, make me say things, but let's say <laughs> in slang, but damn, these people have kind of a prototypal thing and we can't put our hands on it, right? You start realizing also why the investiture struggle began, because it was really not a clash of civilization, but surely uh, the the meeting and the concurrence, the competition, and in this sense, the hybridation of different models, different models in Europe that were meeting, in a sense, for the first time, and or at least trying to, to work together in the same places with a joint ambition that was assuming an ever more, in fact, structured and kind of universal and hierarchical substance, that therefore also needed a better definition and practical uh, regulation. So these topics are crucial. Again, every time, I, as you know, I, I study else in my life, but uh, the every time I, I read this stuff and I read the historiographical perspective of great historians in the past that already wrote this generations ago and that, uh, still nobody has absorbed in popular culture, even minimally, it really blows your mind, really sh gives you the idea of how important these dynamics were and how, again, probably we'll never make it to, before civilization collapses again, uh, what, uh, you know, people really understanding their importance. Uh, it, it's hard, it's hard. Not just what the average person says, ah, you know, but I don't really like history, you know because I didn't like it in school type of person. This happens also with people who are supposed to have some kind of education or intelligence or competence that just, you know, refuse to understand that this stuff matters. Probably much more than all the bullshit that people talk about on the internet today, that whine about, to make political activism about, and all these things. Learn history. Like, add quality to your human worth learn things because human work stands only in that right so there's always enough more than uh, you know than just a little to to read and learn all the time right so do yourself that favor please in any case for today we stop it here just hope that you enjoyed this video if you did please share it otherwise Leave a like or subscribe to my channel if you're interested in my upcoming content. And for now, I thank you heartily for listening to me. I wish you a nice time and see you next time.